It's a great uh, pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Christian Samper. Um, many of you will know um, Christian. He's uh, been close to our community over the years. He's, he's currently President and Chief Executive Officer of the Wildlife Conservation Society, but many of you will know Christian from his time at the Smithsonian at Museum and in uh, Colombia before that. He's also one of the architects of the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation. Um, so I think uh, it's absolutely appropriate that uh, he is our, our first plenary speaker this morning. Um, if I can ask you for a round of applause, I'll hand over to, to Christian. Thank you, Paul. Good morning to everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be invited to speak a little bit about the future of plant conservation. And as you can see from my title, what I'm going to try and do today is look into the future and look at how we can link it to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Of course, we're all here because we share this one planet. It's a place where our own history as a species has evolved the last couple hundred thousand years and where life on Earth has played around the last 500 million years. And of course, we share this planet with some 10 million species, including more than 400,000 different species of plants. And these plants are fundamental not only for ourselves, but for so many of the species and the web of life and the intricate patterns of what's happening out there. And one of those species is us. Not just us, but more than 7 billion people that share this planet. And of course, we have been depending on these plants and animals for our livelihoods. And through the work over the years, we have domesticated many of these species that have become core to the agricultural production systems. And thanks to that, has allowed the development of society as we know it today. What I'd like to do in this talk is I'm going to focus on four main elements. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the changes happening in the world and how they're impacting plants and the environment. Then I'm going to give a quick overview of the global strategy for plant conservation, why we did it, and how far we've come. But then more importantly, I'm going to try and look forward and say, where do we go with the global strategy and how do we link it to the UN Sustainable Development Goals? And then I'll finish by sharing some thoughts about the role of botanic gardens in implementing this agenda. So of course, it's quite remarkable to see the transformation that has happened in the planet. This is one of my favorite images that came out of National Geographic a few years ago, showing the human population density around the world linked to income. And of course, 7 billion people that are spread out pretty much every corner of the planet, but huge disparities in terms of the income and the footprint that each of us have. We see that Europe and parts of North America have extraordinarily developed societies with little poverty. And yet we see places like Africa with almost 3 billion people is the projection that we're looking at now. And that human footprint is having a bigger and bigger impact on the places, the nature, the species, the diversity of plants that we share the planet with. And just in our lifetimes, since 1950, the fundamental changes that have happened are quite extraordinary. Human population has more than doubled in just 67 years, now about 7.2, 7.3 billion. During that same period of time, economic output measured through GDP has more than increased sixfold. Interestingly, more and more people are living in cities. And for a few years ago, for the first time, there are more people living in cities than in rural areas. And of course, more and more demand for things like energy and all the consequences of how we derive it. And these people are having a bigger impact on the demand for natural resources on land and on sea. We've seen the increases in the capture of seafood 
We've seen huge increases in aquaculture. We've seen that the area of tropical forests that have been cleared has more than doubled. And we see that now almost three, two thirds to three quarters of the planet is under cultivation and livestock. And it's not only the changes on land, but the consequences and the impacts that this is having on the atmosphere around us. Whether it's carbon dioxide or nitrous oxide or ozone, all of these trends we see are growing exponentially and they're fundamentally changing the nature of the atmosphere and the biosphere as we know it. And of course, one of the most important challenges of our time, of this century, is going to be how do we feed the planet? If we're looking at a population that will grow to 9 to 10 billion people, and not only more people, but more people, less poverty, higher incomes, more demand for food, for energy, and for water, the fundamental question of how do we feed the planet and produce more food without destroying nature is one of the fundamental challenges of our generation. And we see that there's been a growing trend toward agricultural intensification, which is good in some ways, but at the same time is having an impact on many of the areas on the planet. And in a study that was published just a few months ago by one of my colleagues, James Watson, looking at the global human footprint and how much of what we call the wilderness is left, what we find is that today, only about 23% of the planet qualifies as what we would define as wilderness. That is areas that are largely untouched by infrastructure. And more worrisome is that in the last two decades alone, we've lost 10% of the wilderness of the planet. Now that's, the, that's worrisome alone, but if what, what gets really interesting when you start analyzing this by biomes. We know that some of the ecosystems are still in relatively good shape. Places like tundra and boreal forest, we still have two-thirds to more than three-quarters of these areas. And yet you see that some areas like mangroves or tropical dry forests or others, less than 5% of the original cover is left today. And of course, we see, as you see in the slices in red, that places like tropical forests are the kinds of biomes where we have seen the biggest changes in the last two decades. And what we do in the next 10 to 20 years will fundamentally determine how much of this wilderness is left, and not only how much is left, but linked to it, how much of the plant diversity that we share the planet with will be left out there. And it's not only the abstract, it is species. It's real things, it's tangible things. Like this one species, Senecio carbonelli, which is from my home country of Colombia, a, a plant that was endemic to the wetlands in the areas around Bogota, the capital city, only known from two different localities that were lost to development, and a species that was rescued by the Bogota Botanical Garden that brought it into collections and then has restored it back into the wild. It is some of these species that are having an impact, and like this, there's tens of thousands of species that many of you here around the room are studying, are conserving, but not only in our gardens, but out there. And yet, despite these challenges, I'm extraordinarily hopeful about the changes and the moment that we live in our history. The tools that we have, the technologies, the knowledge are extraordinary. When you think about the genomic revolution, our ability to understand the genetics and the genetic diversity of plants and plant populations, and the fact that now we can actually sequence a genome in a matter of hours. When you think about the way we're fundamentally transforming the way we obtain energy, and the fact that things like solar energy and wind energy and others are now competitive and are displacing fossil fuels, the fact that we're redesigning our cities and come, and I'll come back to this later, and transforming the way that we live and the fact that never before have we had more information available at our fingertips to be able to use it to conserve and understand plant diversity. And one of those trends that I think is going to be extraordinarily important 
is the increase in urbanization. Every one of these areas represents dots, represents cities. In red, more than 10 million people. In yellow, all of those over 5 million people. The number of mega cities, urban centers, has grown dramatically. And as you can see in the darker background, this image, for North America and South America, more than 75% of the people live in cities. Europe as well. Africa is still largely rural. But the key issue of urbanization, I think, is going to be one of the important solutions. But behind this, and I think for me, this is the big paradigm that we see as in this image that was done by one of my colleagues, Eric Sanderson, of the island of Manhattan, past, present, and future. The fact that on the one hand, we still have some of these last of the wild places, and on the other hand, we have more and more people living in cities. And that balance between conservation and development and how we balance those two and connect those two is a challenge. And what I would like to advocate today, of course, is that botanic gardens are that connection. Because on the one hand, we will connect people with nature. And we will also use it to understand nature and to preserve it. And that is the extraordinary opportunity. I'm convinced that never before have those 3,000 botanic gardens been more relevant to society than they are today and that they will be in the next century. Now let me move on to talk a little bit about the global strategy for plant conservation. And this is something many of you are familiar with, so I'm going to go over this pretty quickly. But in preparing for this talk, I went back and looked at some images and reflected on the history of that. And uh, a few of your still standing in this picture that was taken in the year 2000. But a number of us uh, came together in Gran Canaria in Spain shortly after the International Botanical Congress in Missouri, in St. Louis. One of the things we said is we really called for the need to have a single global strategy for plant conservation. We issued what was called the Gran Canaria Declaration. The suspicious looking cast of characters you see there were some of the accomplices. Some of them are here, some of us are older, some of us have a few more pounds. But all in all, that was where this idea started. And what was fascinating was to see that only two years later, in 2012, the Convention of Biological Diversity of the United Nations adopted this global strategy for plant conservation as a global framework. Now the important thing, and mo those of you who are not involved with the UN may not realize, is that it was the first time that in the framework of the UN, and in particular of the Convention on Biodiversity, it was the first time that there was a comprehensive strategy looking at particular deliverables or, of, or outcomes that were looking 10 years out. In all the strategy focused on 16 different outcomes that you're all familiar with, I think the most important thing is it provided a framework where the entire community, grassroots, botanic gardens, collections, museums, seed banks, and others could come together to help and to work with governments to try and develop this. Now that, in some ways, laid the foundations for what was to come in 2010 in the framework of the CBD, of the Convention on Biodiversity, when it adopted a 10-year outlook and a 10-year strategy and what was called the Aichi targets. And the Aichi targets were a comprehensive target-driven approach for the entire Convention on Biodiversity. And I would advocate that this probably would not have happened if it had not been for the global strategy for plant conservation. And that was a very important shift in our thinking. It's going from pages of objectives and actions to focusing on outcomes and collective efforts and then, of course, linked to that, one of the things that happened is that we updated the strategy. We reflected on this, and we said, where are we going, and what are the goals for the next 10 years? And you're all familiar with this, so I'm not going to go into it. Suffice it to say that it includes working on understanding diversity, conservation, the use of diversity, education and awareness, and building partnerships. And there's a whole set of targets and measurable outcomes that are included in the strategy and the plan until 2020. And this has been linked to the work of botanic gardens in documents that you all know today. When I reflect in terms of how far we have come in 15 years, 15 years ago is when we adopted the global strategy. And it actually is comforting to see 
how far we've come in a number of areas. I'm going to mention them now, and I'm going to go deeper into some of these and give you some data and some examples later. But just think about this. We've actually come together, pulled together our information, and we have developed a global plant list that now has more than 350,000 recognized species, more than 1 million taxa. And we are, the big institutions have come together and now developing a world floor online that will give universal access to all knowledge about all plants on the planet. We see that the amount of information that's available, that's been digitized that's available, is extraordinary. One of these tools is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF, which has been linked to most of the natural history collections on the planet, and that now has hundreds of millions of records that are available instantly for anyone to use. When I was a young biologist growing up in Bogota, Colombia, most of the knowledge of Colombia was in cities like New York or Madrid, Spain. That information, those type specimens that are digitized, are now available for free for anyone that's out there. Of course, we've continued working the assessment of the status of many of these species. And not only the global assessments, but now we're seeing regional assessments and national assessments that are being done on the conservation of many of these species in many countries. We've also seen an increase in the amount of protected areas set aside. And I'll show you a map about this later. Suffice it to say that now, 14% of the terrestrial surface of the planet and about 6% of the marine area of the planet have been set aside under one kind of protection or other. We also see that the number of species represented, of threatened species represented in botanic gardens has increased. And as was mentioned before by Paul, that's about 38% of the plants that are in danger are in botanic garden collections. That's the good news. The bad news is we're still missing 60% of the threatened species that are not represented in our collections, and we need to come together around this. And of course, there have been incredible efforts focusing around particular sets of species, in particular those important to food security, and I'm going to come back to this later, but there's now a global network of gene banks and organizations like the Crop Diversity Trust that are focusing on their conservation. We've seen growing awareness of the population and the next generation around environmental issues, in particular things like climate change. And of course, many institutions that are now working together, including the Global Partnership for Plant Conservation, that brings together more than 50 institutions and networks. So these are just a few of the results and of the things that I've seen that have happened in the last 15 years. And yet there have been important changes in the world around us. On the one hand, we've been completely focused around the issue of how do we save plant diversity. And at the same time, the global development agenda around us has changed. And the new kid on the block, if you wish, are the UN Sustainable Development Goals that were adopted by the United Nations just a couple years ago. And many of you are familiar with them, but what was interesting and important is that 190 nations of the world came together and adopted a set of 17 goals and 170 targets that are focusing on sustainable development. The good news is many of the elements, in contrast to the previous generation, what were called the Millennium Development Goals, which were largely just around human development, the elements of environment and sustainability are for the first time really included in many of these targets. And you could actually make a case that for almost every one of these 17 goals, Plants and botanic gardens have a role to play, more in some, less in others. And these are well covered in a paper that you will get during this Congress that was discussed at the meeting in St. Louis last year and that will be discussed in a workshop with Suzanne and Peter Weiss Jackson right after this. And it's a very interesting paper that really cross-references the global strategy for plant conservation with the new Sustainable Development Goals. But in view of time, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to focus on three of these goals where I think we have a particularly important role to play. Probably at the core is what's called Sustainable Development Goal 15, which is around protecting and using life on land. And there are many elements in there and targets, suffice it to say, it includes 
uh, halting the loss of biodiversity, preventing the extinction of threatened species, dealing with afforestation, the use of genetic resources. And let me just show you a few examples of what we can do. Clearly, as botanic gardens, we have an extraordinary collection of plants. As was mentioned before, one out of every three species of plants that we know today is in our collections. That is a remarkable tribute to more than 200 years of work in collecting and assembling this information, and this is helping us preserve this diversity. We've also seen an increase in seed banks, not only of agricultural species, which I'll talk about later, but of many taxa, for example, the Millennium Seed Bank at Kew and some of the ones that were shown before. And we're seeing more and more species that are being preserved for the future. But of course, what many people don't still realize is that the botanic gardens are very active places of research. And the herbaria and the specimens that we have document the history of life on this planet, of plant life on this planet. And every one of those specimens that we have tells a story. It's a data point in a particular place, in a particular point in time. And by assembling this knowledge and making information, we can start doing assessments and understanding where is it found? How is it related? And many of you are doing this. And the good news is we're making incredible progress in digitizing this knowledge and making it available. Making it available using the web and some of the resources that are now available for free by many of you that have them. But we're using that to assemble this tree of life. Between this and the genetic tools that we have, we're really starting to assemble the information and for the first time understanding how plants are related to each other. We're also starting to use it to understand the structure of some of the populations of plants out there. And of course, we're using it to assemble a picture of plant diversity in the planet. And understanding the centers of plant diversity and endemism is key in terms of designing effective protected area networks and conservation, not only in gardens, but in the places of origin of these plants. And yet one of the big paradigms that we have is that if you look at a map like this, you see in red and in purple the areas, the highest species richness. And yet the, botanic, the capacity of botanical research institutions is still very disparate. And this was one of the maps that was produced combining the data from William Barthlot and some of the data from BGCI. And even though the data has changed, fundamentally the key challenge that we have is the bulk of the capacity to study, conserve, and use botanical diversity is still found in North America and Europe. And if you look at places like Africa, the botanical capacity is still relatively weak. And one of the things that we need to do is help build and bolster that capacity in the places of origin. As I mentioned before, one of the things that's happened, and one of the IET targets when it was adopted in 2010, was a global goal to preserve 17% of the terrestrial area and 10% of the marine areas of the planet for conservation through protected areas. The good news is we've continued to make good progress. Many governments have taken steps to increase this, particularly in the marine realm. In the last five years alone, the proportion of the oceans that have been set aside for conservation has doubled from 3% to 6%. Since 2010, we've increased the percentage of terrestrial protected areas by almost 3%. Another way of looking at the same map is by countries and looking at how far these countries have come in meeting the AT targets. And you can see in dark green the countries that, at least on paper, have set aside more than 17% for conservation. And then lighter colors here in yellow, those that are falling well below 5% and have a long ways to go in terms of conservation. And needless to say, our challenge is to meet those targets, but to do protected areas in the right places, and more importantly, to get them to work, because many of these are still paper parks but informing the places where these areas should be set aside so that they effectively represent the centers of diversity and endemism and origin of many of these vascular plants is one of the challenges and one of the places that we need to work on. In this regard, we've launched a new effort at the IUCN Congress last year to do a set of key biodiversity areas for different species, including plants, birds, mammals, and many others. But that's something you're pretty familiar with. 
But there's another very important issue, and at the core of the Sustainable Development Goals is human well-being. And of course, one of the most fundamental elements of human well-being is around hunger and access to food and food security. And if you look at some of the elements and some of the targets under goal two, which is to achieve zero hunger by the year 2030, you can see some of these goals. Doubling agricultural productivity, which is going to require using plants and plant diversity. Maintaining the diversity of seeds and wild crop relatives is a specific goal in there. Well-managed seeds and plant banks, read botanical gardens. Implementing resilient farming practices and strengthening the adaptation to climate change, among others. I would argue that most of what is in goal two cannot be achieved without the conservation and use of plant diversity. And of course, this comes back to domestication. Because we know that we've taken a handful of species around the planet and domesticated them and use them effectively to build entire food systems. And all of this diversity in these crops have been cross-changed, moved around the world. And they're the underlying element behind the food systems and the food security that's sustaining 7 billion people on the planet. Whether it's rural areas and markets like Malaysia, or whether it's areas and cities like New York or London, or Geneva. And yet what we know is that we have lost an incredible amount of this genetic diversity. Here's just some data that was provided by the Global Crop Diversity Trust. In China, we have lost 90% of the varieties of rice since 1950. Mexico has lost 80% of the diversity of the varieties of maize just since 1900. India, same issue with rice varieties. And even in places like Germany, all of the apples that are consumed in Germany really derive from only six varieties. So one of the big challenges, if we really want to do this, is not only to preserve species, but to preserve the genetic diversity. The good news is there is a whole network around these. One of those is what's called the CGIR, which is a network of international centers that have been around for the last 50 years. And as I mentioned before, an organization was created called the Global Crop Diversity Trust that's specifically focused on supporting and financing the conservation of this genetic diversity. Because it is these seed banks and the fact that they're preserving varieties, like in the case of beans, more than 28,000 different varieties and wild crop relatives are being conserved by these gene banks. And that information, that genetic diversity, is fundamental to improve the quality the nutritional value of these, and very importantly, for the adaptation to things like climate change. And let me just give you one example out of the work of one of the centers of the CG called CIAT, which is, relates to how we use genetic diversity to promote adaptation of food systems to climate change. Now, we all know, and despite some of the things that are happening and statements from countries like the United States these days, that the world is changing very rapidly. And it's not only about getting warmer, it's that precipitation patterns are going to change. Some of the areas of the planet are going to be a lot drier, and some are going to be wetter. And the question is, what's the impact of these things on the food production systems? And how do we double food production without doubling the area that's under cultivation right now? And what we're seeing is that this diversity is extremely important. And one example of the work of SIAT is from East Africa. And in this case, the production of beans. What you see on the left is the areas under bean production in East Africa. Every area in green and yellow are the areas where it's being produced right now. What was very important is when you look at the climate change scenarios and the current varieties of beans that are being used there, what was looked at by my colleagues at SEAD was that 60% of the areas under bean production would no longer be able to produce beans by 2050, 60%. This would create an incredible problem in terms of the livelihoods of millions and millions of people that live there. And yet what we've seen is that by using the genetic diversity in these seed banks, generating new varieties of beans and introducing them, what you can see is that you can generate varieties that would allow you to produce beans up to three degrees Celsius warmer. 
And the net result of this, just by using genetic diversity in this case in beans in a place like Africa, that alone can probably fundamentally change the livelihoods and food security of probably 100 million people right there. You take this, scale it up across varieties around the planet, and it makes the case, a pretty compelling case, about why the sustainable development goals and goal number two cannot be met without this. And these are the examples. I already mentioned them. We're also using this to improve the nutritional value of beans, things like zinc. And by doing this, we're increasing the livelihoods and improving the livelihoods of people that are out there. And of course, nowadays, with the tools that we have, it's not just genetic diversity within these systems, but the ability to uh, generate other varieties with other genes that would make them resistant, reduce the use of uh, things like fertilizers, and improve the water use efficiency. And the third and last example I want to talk about has to do with building sustainable cities and communities. So as I mentioned before, more than half of people on the planet are living in cities. By 2050, probably 75% of the people on the planet will live in cities. And that's good news. It's good news because it will concentrate people that could potentially reduce our footprint. And there is a role that we need to play. Because as we look at cities like New York, which is where I live nowadays, this is the issue. More and more people, more and more concentrated in these urban systems, which are extraordinary places for innovation and economic growth. And yet we see fewer and fewer spaces. New York has Central Park, which is extraordinary. And yet we see a place like Central Park as a space for recreation. And really what it is is a botanic garden in the making. It's an incredible place where you can connect people with nature. Because as more and more people live in these cities, you face more and more challenges. How do you transform? How do you transportation? How do you obtain energy? How do you obtain food? The good news is that there's a new vision for these cities that's developing. We're starting to see new transportation systems. We're starting to see energy uses. We're starting to see local food farm markets and many other areas. And there is an incredible opportunity to fundamentally transform cities to make them more sustainable. And what I think is that botanic gardens have a key role to play, not only in the gardens of spaces, but in terms of projecting the gardens into the cities and dealing with things like uh, planting trees in cities and interpretation in many of these areas. But gardens will be windows into nature. They're the places where these people that grow and live increasingly disconnected from nature will be found. And what we see is that our role will be more relevant. And I'm just going to finish with a few thoughts about what's going to happen. When we think about botanic gardens, we often think about images like this. A picture I took a few days ago at the New York Botanical Garden, one of the places where I spend a lot of time these days. And of course, you, people come to these gardens to see an incredible diversity of plants and marvel at these species. And yet the good news is botanic gardens are also starting to change. This is also the New York Botanical Garden. And what we see is that entire parts of the garden that are not just devoted to exotic plants, but to food systems and food security. And what we see is that it's not only about what we have in our gardens, but it's taking our work out there. It's looking at the transformation that's happening in places like Panama in this photograph, where we see increasing deforestation, habitat loss, and the importance of understanding the plants that are there and conserving them, but at the same time, figuring out and using the knowledge that we have to help with processes that will allow us to generate plants, to build nurseries, and to use them in afforestation and reforestation programs in these places. And this will have a very important to role to play in terms of climate change. As you know, about 17% of the CO2 emissions in the planet come from tropical deforestation. If we can slow that rate of deforestation, we can slow climate change. And at the same time, we can restore degraded areas through things like reforestation and afforestation that will be very important going forward. So I would summarize our work in, these, in this one image. At the core of what we do, it's plant diversity. But I think there are four words that need to define what we do, and almost everyone here is doing them. We need to continue to explore the plant diversity and do science and make it available. We need to inspire people that come there through our education programs and strengthen the conservation message and content 
of our gardens. We need to conserve the plant diversity. We need to make sure that all those threatened species are actually found in botanic gardens and out there. And we need to use that diversity in terms of meeting the sustainable development goals in some of these areas. But here's my plea. Don't just do it in your gardens at your places. Let's help build the capacity of gardens in some of these other countries. Let's fill out that map. Let's make sure that we work together, not only in our places, but join forces to make sure that some of those protected areas that are important for plant diversity are preserved for the future. And that's going to be a matter of resources. Nowadays, I spend a lot of time working with the zoological community. We've adopted a goal for every zoo in the United States of America to spend 5% of its revenues on field conservation. If we meet that target alone, that will generate more than $500 million a year for conservation. Just imagine if every botanic garden represented around the world spent 5% of its budget on conservation, and more importantly, if we did it together. We could together mobilize over $1 billion to make sure that these places that are fundamental for plant diversity are going to be around for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, we live in a planet that is constantly changing. Our footprint is bigger and bigger. The people living in these cities still depend on plant diversity. And yet, what we need to do is focus on supporting those people and supporting life, uh, the diversity of plants. And I think that one of the core elements of what we need to do is tie our work to the everyday needs and livelihoods of people. And one of the ways of doing it is through food. And we need to strengthen that message and show how our collections and what we do and what we have is fundamental for food security and adaptation to climate change. And I just want to draw your attention to an initiative that was just launched earlier this month called Food Forever, and invite all of you to join this. And Marie Haga is going to speak tomorrow, and she'll tell you a lot more about this. But I would hope that every garden around here subscribes to the Food Forever movement and starts incorporating these elements in your messages and content. This is fundamental for our livelihoods, for the human well-being of those 7 billion people on the planet, soon to be 9 billion. But it's also essential to make sure that we support all of the other species that we share this planet with and that intricate web of life. Thank you very much.